Hey, Tommy and Eddie here to talk to you about something really great, Palm Sunday. Yeah, that's the Sunday that we paint our palms purple to commemorate King Saul talking to that palm reader lady, and then we wave him in the air. <laughs> no, no it's not. Yes it is. No it's yes, not. Yes it no. is. What Bible do you read? Palm Sunday commemorates the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Now picture this, Jesus rode in on a donkey while the crowds put their cloaks and palm branches all over the ground shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. That's what I said. What I meant. Okay, now picture this. Jesus' popularity was going viral. I mean, he just raised Lazarus from the dead in the same community just a few days earlier. Wait, post dead Lazarus was maybe at the very first Palm Sunday? Yeah, probably. That's so cool. I bet if he was there, he was probably like, And you're a thriller, thriller, Jesus. You raised me from the dead when you said, Get up, get up, get up, ooh! Now, to complete all of this, Jesus needed a donkey. Now you'd think that a king or a prince would ride in on a horse, but not Jesus. He knew the message that he wanted to send. You see, a donkey represents peace. Anybody riding a donkey represented peaceful intentions. Yeah, it says right here in Matthew 21, it says that Jesus sent two of his disciples to get him a donkey. Yeah. Hey, I wonder which two he sent. Mm, maybe Thomas. I doubt it. I bet he sent Andrew. Andrew would totally do that and probably Tony. I bet he said Andrew and Tony. Tony's not a disciple. Oh, sorry. Tony is. It's still not a disciple. What translation of the Bible do you read? Jesus needed a donkey, so he asked two disciples to go get him a donkey. He told them they would find one in town, tied there next to a colt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he says, untie them and bring them to me. And if somebody asks you about it, you tell them the Lord needs them? Jeez. Yeah. What? Well, Jesus just told his disciples to go steal a donkey for him. What Bible do you read? It doesn't say that at all. I can't figure this out. I mean, Jesus, he changed water into wine. Cool. He fed the 4,000. He fed right? the 5,000. What? He fed the 5,000. It doesn't matter. It does matter. Not the fourth. It's the 5,000. We're splitting hairs. I'm sorry. Jesus fed a large group of people. and That's cool. He, he healed people with leprosy. He raises Lazarus from the dead and then boom, he's like, hey guys, go steal me a donkey. I'm just saying, I don't think that's very WWJD. The significance of Jesus riding in on a donkey, which he did not steal, was to fulfill the prophecy that is found in Zechariah 9.9. Yeah, but the... And the king riding in on a lowly donkey with his way paved with palm branches, the palm branches symbolize triumph or victory. The what? The palm branches. The bran... Palm thought... branches, Palm the... Sunday. I thought it was the palm. They should call it Branch Sunday, because that's confusing. We all have palms with us all the time. I just, I feel bad. I, I'm sorry, Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is a time for us to prepare our hearts for the agony of his passion and the joy of his resurrection. So this week, let's cover the road to the cross with our hearts, our souls, and our minds as we reflect on the final week of Jesus' life. And let's celebrate in anticipation the return of the King of Kings. That's the skit, guys, in case you've never seen them before. They do a lot of fun, a lot of poignant dramas that uh, really bring the message to light sometimes. And I like that one in particular. And I like the quote from... The bald skit guy. And he says, prepare our hearts for the agony of his passion and the joy of his resurrection. If you're taking notes, that's the first one. So you look at the notes and go from there. I like how he says that because that's what it is. And then I think about it for a minute and then I go, so what does that passion look like from our end? How do we prepare our hearts? How do we do that? And I first start with the people on the first fall Sunday. I'm a history major. I like the history stuff, so I let's start with the history of it. What did they do? They went crazy. Jesus came into town riding on a colt, and they're shouting massive crowds, Hosanna, Hosanna putting their garments, putting their branches on the ground so the donkey didn't have to walk on the dirty ground because it's a donkey. 
But that's what they were doing. They went nuts. And I thought, how do we show passion like that today? When do we show passion like that today? And a couple ideas crossed my mind. You guys remember, some of you, when the Beatles first came to America? And people, especially young ladies, went berserk. Screaming, crying, yelling, going nuts. <sighs> okay, that might be kind of what it's like, but that was in the 60s, right? Oh, teenagers, you're not off the hook. One Direction. If you don't know who One Direction is, you're lucky. It's another British boy band that has recently made an impact, I guess. But the kids go crazy for One Direction. Again, that's really not what it is. What about, and since I don't really care about either one of those things, what would I maybe be more passionate about that I would care about? And those of you guys who know me know that I like football. And maybe sometimes we're passionate about that. And if you don't know, this is faces in the crowd of the Alabama-Auburn game a couple years ago where Auburn turned, returned the kick 100 yards for a touchdown at the end of the game to win the game. And I remember them showing that little boy in the upper right, was far, yeah, upper right corner. He was just sobbing, and his dad's trying to console him because they lost the game. And I remember in 1982, Dwight Clark made this catch in the end zone for the 49ers over the Cowboys, and the Cowboys lost, and I was sobbing, and my father consoled me. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, my dad said, son, it's okay, it's just a game. And I'm like, I know, but tomorrow the kids at school are going to pick on me. <laughs> That's called growing up a Cowboys fan in Lions country. <laughs> but the <laughs> brain's laughing at me now. And that really is some of the stuff we get passionate about today. But it doesn't really compare to what we're supposed to feel in our hearts for the King of Kings, for Jesus. So it can't be a cultural passion. It can't be a pop culture fashion, compassion, or passion, excuse me. It's got to be deeper than that. So how do we get there? How do we start that process? Romans 12, 2 says this, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by, the changing, by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Okay, that's a start. Don't copy the pop culture. Don't copy the pattern of this world. Okay, I'm getting it so far. Galatians 6, 15, the second half of the verse says this, what counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. That gets me to realize that maybe our passions and priorities aren't exactly what they should be. So our passions have to be greater than sports, music, cars, movies, books, etc. All these things that we love that are part of our culture today. And I'm guilty of caring about all of those things too much at times, whether it's sports and football, whether it's in the movies. My dog's name was Chewbacca. My dog's now, his name is Murray, which that backfired on me kind of, if you know football. And the Lions fans laughing, hey, take that one, yep. It can't just be something we're into. We're into a lot of things, and they're fun. There's nothing wrong with those things. But if that's the limit of our passion for Christ, that's not getting it done. The second thing that we tend to have out of priority in our culture, politics, national pride, or social status. It can't be just like that. If you're like me, and <laughs> some of you are, some of you aren't, but I see all the time on Facebook different political rants, and people are so passionate, and they're angry and it's divisive and gets me riled up sometimes and but it's got to be deeper than that it can't be just about that it's got to be more than that and 
I regret that I hurt my shoulder and I couldn't stay in the army more because I wanted to serve our country more. I wish that hadn't happened, but it did. Social status. Then we're getting into the materialistic kind of things of our society. Is money and comfort. Our status in the community. Are those the kind of things that we care about the most? Are those the kind of things that we're passionate about, that we want to make happen? Do our actions show that's really how we want to live? Hopefully not. Hopefully we understand this. We're Christians first, Americans second, or Chinese, or whatever. Okay? I've got to have that priority and balance. Understand that as passionate as it might be for our country and the good things it represents, I can't be equally as passionate about Jesus. I've got to be more passionate about Jesus. This last one is the hardest one of all for me, and probably for many of you. Our passion has to be greater than our love of family. That seems counterintuitive in a way. Doesn't family come first? Shouldn't that be our highest priority? No. No. Jesus tells people who ask him, pick up your cross and follow me. He told one young man, don't bother to go back and say goodbye, let's just go. And he says, no, I've got to go back and tell my family. And that, No, you need to follow me first. And that's hard for me to swallow because I know how much I love my wife and I love my kids. I've got to love Jesus more because really the reality is to love them the best, I must love Jesus more. The more I follow Jesus, the more I'm obedient to him, the more I strive to be like him, the more capable I am to love my family. The more equipped I am, the more room for love in my heart. It gets bigger somehow. I don't know how that works. It just does to love my family. The more patient I can be with my family, the more connected I am. And just as an example, I guarantee you if I get short with my kids, I do sometimes. If I get short with Jody, and I do sometimes. I probably haven't spent enough time that day with Jesus, if any. Funny how that works. But when I do spend time with him, again, my capacity has increased, and I'm able to love them best. So that pretty much sums up our first step in how we prepare our hearts. First step is be transformed. Set right priorities so we have proper passions. But there's more to it than just, more to being transformed than just setting good priorities and having the right perspective. We have to do this too, and this is harder in a lot of ways. We have to be honest about our sin, honest about our shortcomings, honest about our mistakes. We don't want to do that. I'll explain why in a second. Proverbs 28, 13 says this, people who conceal their sins will not prosper, but if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. Romans 1, 21, 22. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. Then in verse 25, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Again, that social media thing shows me this reality all the time. I see it. I see it in some of my former students. I see it in other people on Facebook and Instagram and things as well. I see these two th realities about sin. Number one, people will do almost anything to deny their sin. They will lie and say, I never did that, or I never was there, whatever it is. We don't want to admit it. We, whether we feel guilty or just don't want to face it, we deny it. We do this too. We start to change truth. Well, what I did really wasn't wrong. 
and we'll try to justify it for whatever reason. Or the Bible really doesn't mean that. Yes, it does, but we don't want to admit it. We don't want to acknowledge our sin. We're intellectually dishonest at times. Our mind and our heart knows what's right. We know we need to fix it, but we don't want to admit it because we don't want to face it for whatever reason. Which is part of the next thing. We all do it. It's not limited to people I see on Facebook. It includes me. It includes all of us. We all have a hard time admitting when we're wrong. And we all need help. Now, don't worry. I'm not going to get the mic back out and say, okay, everyone come here and share with everybody everything you've done wrong this week. Not going to do that. Don't worry. But each of us needs help dealing with things in our hearts that we need to fix. It starts with, as we talked about it in Sunday school with the teens a couple weeks ago, confessing to God, talking to him about it in prayer. Help me deal with this, Lord. Forgive me. And he always does. But then in our effort not to do it again, we need to trust somebody that we love, that we know loves us, that we know wants what's best for us. And if I need help dealing with an issue, I need to identify who the person is that can help me the most, to help hold me accountable, to help me learn, and not do it anymore. And that could be a husband, could be a wife, could be a friend, could be a pastor, youth pastor. Depends on the situation. But get help. Talk to somebody. And that's not going to be easy. I'm not saying that it is. But it's amazing how our burdens are lifted when we share them together. Even when it's our own fault. So we all do it. We all need help. The last step. Really know Jesus. Please watch this. He's the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his
How many times I've seen that or heard that, but it doesn't matter. Still, just, that's who he is. Reverend, in case you don't know, this is Reverend Lockbridge, the gentleman who gave that sermon. And uh, SM stands for Shadrach Meshach Lockbridge. A little bit different name. I love how um, two-thirds of the way through it, he says, he's indescribable. And because you could go on and on and on, and he kind of did. But the most poignant thing he says, do you know him? Do you understand that that's really who he is? He didn't leave room for doubt. He didn't. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Are you the Messiah? Are you the Son of God? Yes. No one, no other, author, no other figure in history, again, history geek, had the courage or will to say that. We better listen. And if you don't know him, What are you waiting for? If you don't know him, why wait? He says, I wonder if you know him. When you do, setting those priorities and those passions gets a lot easier. When you do, you know confessing your sin both to him and to someone whom you love and trust is easier because it's a safe place. And when you know him and you get how big he is, you're in awe of how you're loved, in awe of how you're forgiven. And when I see that and I, that video and I hear those words and reminded of that, it still moves me. And I hope that it moves you too. And again, not just, I'm not accusing anybody of this, don't get me wrong. We don't just clap because, yes, that's what we're supposed to think. But it's deep. And it gets deeper and deeper. And that's how we feel. And that's who we really are. Followers of the one true king. Followers of Jesus. In a moment, I'm going to pray for everybody. When I do, if you need to talk to him about anything from you know there's something you need to deal with in your heart, a priority you need to adjust, or just you want to tell him you want to know him for the first time. The altar is open again. Come up here and pray some more. That's okay. We can do it again. Let's pray. Father, all week long as I've talked to you, I've been in awe of who you are and your love for me and how you increase my capacity to love those around me. I'm not perfect. None of us are. But we're made perfect through you so that we can know you forever. You're my king. 
and I ask that you be real to each and every person here today. Whoever they need to experience you, be there in ways only you can. Help all of us know you more deeply, more intimately. Help all of us be able to share your love with each other so that when burdens and hurts do come up, we're there for each other. You put us there. You love us through one another. Help us experience you. Help us appreciate this week what you did. May our hearts be prepared to celebrate everything you did for us, this week in particular. To know that on Friday we celebrate, <laughs> it's weird to say it, but celebrate your death. But it's because on Sunday we celebrate your ultimate triumph, your resurrection, your conquering of death. It's not just for me, but you would have done it just for me. And that's the reality for each and every one of us. You would have done it for each of us, and you did do it for each of us. Thank you for that truth. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for being our king. Help all of us know you better. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Sunday brunch next Sunday. There's Monday, Thursday service here at 7. Enjoy today. Enjoy a great week. Thank you. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea.